peripheral nervous system day two. <laughs> All right, um, so today we're going to be going over ways to test the peripheral nervous system and to see how that connects with the central nervous system and different things to look for to discriminate between a peripheral nerve lesion and a central nerve lesion. So one of the main things that we look at is the simple reflex that you always see your doctors doing. And the way that works is you have your extrafusal fibers and your intrafusal fibers in your muscle. Now, we take the hammer and we whack on the knee. So when that happens, we make we stretch these extrafusal extra fibers and that sends that summates these 1A afferents which sends a signal out through the dorsal root and up to the brain, but as it does that, it sends off a branch which synapses onto an alpha motor neuron and the ventral horn, which goes back out to the muscle and stimulates the muscle to make a twitch. So when, we're, when we perform these tests, we want to look for normal reflexes, which it's going to be a little different with everybody and we want to compare them side to side, which is a little bit different than the way normal doctors use this thing. Because usually the normal doctors, they see if there's a reflex. If there is, is it a crazy hyper reflex or is there no reflex at all? If there's no reflex at all, that usually means that there would be a lower uh, peripheral nerve lesion. If there's a upper motor neuron lesion from the central nervous system, it would be hyper reflexive. So those are two of the things you just need to look for. But we also know that the, the uh, ventral horn cells, alpha motor neurons, are kind of like the end of all the accumulation of um, descending tracks that integrate into the um, spinal cord. So we have your PMRF, which controls uh, motor tone. So if it's different from one side to another, and you do reflexes on one side, and you compare them to the other side, you might have a difference in tone. So that's one way of assessing things. Another way of using the reflexes is to see rate to fatigue like Josh was talking about the other day. Keep whacking it, whacking it, see if it's brisk at first and then see how long it takes to the reflex dies out. And that can give you a, a window into how the person's metabolic um, capacity is. So that's just basic, simple, you over the reflex art. Um, for sensory testing, we're going to be using our pinwheel, and we also do that side to side and compare and ask the patient, should I draw this out? Yeah. Mm, you don't have to. Okay. So we're just asking the patient if they feel anything different from side to side. Now, if they do feel a difference, I just learned this the other day, you actually you want to go ahead and do those tests over again, but you want to do it in the opposite direction because when you do uh, stimulate the parietal cortex, there is a thalamic reverberation loop and you want to make sure that it's not just that loop that they're feeling. So if it's like, okay, I run my pinwheel on my right arm, then my left arm, and then they're like, okay, the left arm, I felt a little bit more. It could just be that thalamic reverberation. So to make sure that it's not, you do it in the opposite direction on the second time and then you ask them if it felt the same. And if it did, then there actually is a sensory deficit. If it didn't, then it's probably just that thalamic reverberation. Um, that's about all I got. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So let's do a little bit of clinical laughs while we can. Stay up here. I'm going to need a patient. Okay. Let me sit down. So when we talk about peripheral nerve entrapments, we're talking about it getting stuck somewhere outside of the central nervous system. So we could say it could be what spinal nerve root, and we can test for that using orthopedic tests. As far as that, we can do traditional chiropractic. It can be pretty decent as far as managing that. If it's stenosis, it's a little bit trickier, but we're really good at handling discs. Um, if it's a little bit distal to that, then we can start treating it with adjustments, soft tissue stuff, and seeing pretty profound effects. So. In general, if this nerve right here has had compression on it for a long time, it's going to get sensitive, it's going to become hypoxic. So it's not exactly that it's pinching the nerve and that's why it's not working, that it's pinching the capillaries that supply the nerve. And then it becomes hypoxic and starts dysfunctioning. 
So, yeah, there's a lot of muscle testing and sensory testing we can do to decide where the lesion is. In general, the more stuff you lose, the higher the lesion goes. So if it's just this finger is numb, it's probably somewhere in the hand. But if this entire hand is numb, it could be somewhere in the neck, the shoulder, higher up. So you do your muscle testing, you do your sensory testing that we learned here. But the neuro guys, they make it real simple. Okay, he's got numbness in these three fingers. It's either carpal tunnel or it's pronator teres. Put pressure on the carpal tunnel. Does your hand go numb? Yes. So it's carpal tunnel. Put pressure on the pronator teres. Does your hand go numb? No. So it's carpal tunnel. If it goes numb just by pressing there, you're stimulating the normal compression that it has. It's going to react the way it normally does. So I come from a soft tissue background, and pronator teres entrapment is often mistaken as carpal tunnel when the entrapment's coming here. So don't let a surgeon go and cut open their carpal tunnel if this is where it's getting pinched. I want to take care of the problem. You can do EKG testing, but what we do as neurologists is we're going to test it, it goes numb, we're going to do a therapy, and then we're going to retest it to see if it goes better, and that way we can skip all that crap. So a real easy way to take care of pronator teres entrapment, which would be impinging on the median nerve, making these three fingers go numb, and all sorts of weakness in your wrist flexor, your finger flexors, is an ART approach. Here's your pronator teres. It goes from this medial of a condyle out to the radius. Go ahead and pronate the arm. You shorten it. Put pressure right on that pronator teres belly, and then supinate. Let go. Repronate. Pressure. Supinate. You do this about four or five times, and you're decreasing the tone in that um, pronator teres. And then we're going to go ahead and retest it. Is your hand still numb? It's perfect. There we go. <laughs> easy. So that's how you deal with pronator teres entrapment real easily. Now, the neuro guys like to fast stretch muscles. When you fast stretch something, you hit the muscle spindles, or the GTOs rather, it inhibits the muscle, brings down the tone in the muscle. So what they'll do is they'll pinch it, bring it out here, and then open it, just like that. You're fast stretching the muscle while applying a tensile load to it. It's going to hit those GTOs and inhibit the muscle. And that's how you could do that too. So we should have an adjusting seminar with um, Klopsik sometime and he'll show us all of these moves. Um, that's a real easy one. Go ahead and sit up for me. And go ahead and rotate. Now let's say like he's got numbness down in this ulnar region, right? I'm thinking TOS. It could be an ulnar nerve entrapment. It could be what, C6, 7, 8? So it could be an 8. Does your ulnar finger go numb? Say no. No. So it's not coming in from his neck. Real easy, right? probably TOS. So you can do all your AdSense or TOS testing, right? So we'll bring your arm back. Go ahead and rotate your arm. And then does your hand go numb? Say yes. Yes. <laughs> so it looks like it's coming from his scalings. Anterior scalings, brachial plexus comes through here, subclavian artery comes through here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to shorten the length of the anterior scalings, which comes right here from his TPs down to his first rib. Shorten it, pinch it, and then lengthen it out. And do this a couple times. And when every time I do this, I'm breaking up adhesions, I'm decreasing the tone in that anterior scaling, it's taking pressure off brachial plexus, off the subclavian, restoring blood flow to his arm. Do it a couple more times. Go ahead. Does your hand go numb? No. Cool. Test, treat, retest. That's a really easy way to do anterior scalings. What would the neuro guys do? Probably something like this. You're fast stretching this side of his neck and the decrease the tone and the increase the tone on this side. That's gonna pull his neck back over, take pressure off that arterial supply. Real easy, guys. Real easy. Face down. Sciatic, sciatica, you see this on a lot of people. Um, what was it? Is it bowstrings test? No. Um, Real easy way to do it, you have them supine, you take the leg up, you bring it in, you rotate it in, you hold it there for a couple seconds, you see if the leg starts going numb. Every time somebody has sciatica, it's going to be numbness below the knee. That's going to be like your big thing. There's other things are like bowstring tests, there's orthopedic tests. Put pressure right on the piriformis, hold it for a minute, I'm putting pressure on that sciatic nerve where it's usually compressed. Is your leg going numb? Mm -hmm. There we go. Sounds like sciatica. Positive test, intervene. The way I intervene, piriformis attaches from the greater trochanter to the inside of the sacrum. 
So by bringing his leg up and internally rotating it, sorry, externally rotating it, I'm approximating those two positions. It's hard, to, you don't want to stress your fingers, so I usually use an elbow for that piriformis. Get right on there, get real deep on it, shortening it, pressure, lengthening it out. Take pressure off, shorten it again, put your pressure, pull it out. Every time I do this, what am I doing to the piriformis? Decreasing the muscle tone, inhibiting the muscle, taking pressure off that sciatic nerve, and then is your leg still numb? It's perfect. There we go. Perfect. Go ahead and roll on your side facing me. Real easy, easy to do for sciatica. You do it, do that move maybe five, ten times over a couple of visits, and you just keep rehabbing the piriformis until it's good. Now, the way the neurology guys do this, bring them into a side posture, find the muscle belly of the piriformis right in there, part pisy on it, and then you bring them over, you fast stretch that muscle. And when you fast stretch, like I was saying, you fire the GTOs, you inhibit the muscle, go ahead and roll over onto your other side. So I just stretched it from the greater trochanter side. I can come in again, I don't remember how they did this. Come in again, now it's involved side, it's down, and I'm gonna go on the piriformis near the sacrum. You guys can't see this, let's flip. Head's over here. And then I'll bring your head over here. So now that involved piriformis is down, his sacrum's right here. Go right near that sacral insertion point, hard pisy on that piriformis. Bring them over, fast stretch the piriformis. Again, firing the GTOs, inhibiting the muscle, taking pressure on that sciatic nerve. Really easy. Um, really common other nerve entrapment, lateral femoral cutaneous nerve is going to be coming off of the spine, coming right here underneath the inguinal ligament and then providing sensory sensation to the lateral part of the leg. We call this neuralgia parasthetica. Um, if it's purely sensory. So if they have motor losses, it's not this. Your diagnosis is wrong. So what's going on here? Underneath is going to be the um, psoas muscle. Then you're going to have this nerve. On top is going to be the inguinal ligament. Now the inguinal ligament is bone to bone. So you can't really change the length by changing the positioning of the bone. You can't really inhibit it because it's not a muscle. So you can't really work on the inguinal ligament all that well. You could do a little bit of soft tissue work or ultrasound, try and break up adhesions, but you're not really going to change the tone in that. SOT. <coughs> SOT. There we go. Oh, excuse me. The way I do this, I try and inhibit the psoas muscle. Since that's the floor of it, you take the tone in the psoas muscle off, psoas goes down, a little bit more room for that nerve. They say this is actually a pretty easy one to correct. So go ahead, bring your leg up. Move your arm to your side. So as muscle is going to be on the lumbars right there, coming underneath that to his lesser trochanter. Go ahead, shorten the psoas, put pressure on it, lengthen the psoas out. Do this a couple times, and then you can do it with your leg. Start it up, bring your leg up, and I want you to go ahead and lower it down when I say go, okay? So, yeah, up, I'm right there on that psoas, and down. There we go. Retest it, it still hurt? Just say no. <laughs> so, really easy way to do it. Now, there's a bunch of other nerve entrapments, and ART gets all into them, but they're actually relatively really easy to treat without having to get somebody into surgery. Yeah. Cool, you got it? Okay, cool.